Thank you, George, for taking the time to do this. No, it's my pleasure. Yeah. Glad to be here. Uh, George has been a very long time friend uh, of my dad and also me now. And it's always been a privilege talking to you so many times. Uh, yeah. I've, I've always had fun. Right, right. And yes, I've been here more, more than 10, 11 years. I've been coming and going. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've, had lot, I've spent lots of time with you at different times during that period. Correct, yeah. Here you've been Dharamshala. Right? Yeah, I, 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 I travel, uh -huh. but I, off, I usually come back to McLeod Gange, and I use this as my base. Right. And of course, that's where your mother's restaurant is. That's right. So yeah. that's how I know you. Right. And what, out of India, what really made you want to come to Dharamshala specifically? Because obviously India is very diverse and massive. It is. Yeah. And there were several reasons, really. Um, initially, I learned to teach English. Mm -hmm. And I did a TEFL course. Mm -hmm. And and then I, um, I was trying to figure out, OK, so I'm, you know, I'm taking a break from my IT job. Mm -hmm. right. And I want to maybe travel somewhere and teach English. So I did the TEFL course and then I was thinking, now where shall I go to teach English? And I thought Spain, I the Czech Republic, mm -hmm. um, Poland. I was, Poland. You know, um, and, then, um, and then through the TEFL organization, I saw an advert saying, mm -hmm. come and teach Tibetan refugees I English. See. And I there, was a, there was an organization in Dharamshala mm -hmm. where they were uh, taking teachers for Tibetan refugees. I so I, I applied for that job mm -hmm. and it had gone. Okay, okay. But the seed of the idea had been planted and, nice. and, and I thought I'd really, I'd really like to go to Dharamshala and see Tibetan refugees. And, right. and I'm, I'm very interested in philosophy and Buddhist philosophy and Tibetan mm -hmm. philosophy. I, I, I'd enjoyed watching the Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. I'd enjoyed Indian uh, traditions. Mm -hmm. And, and it was very tempting. And so I just came here just by myself, not knowing anybody. I see. And um, in fact, initially I worked in a, in a primary school. Primary school. Yeah, that's right. And so it was 12 or 13 year olds. Nice. And they, gave, they very kindly gave me space to take lessons there with these young children. But I'm not a trained teacher. I see. Okay. And, and, and so it was okay. But these children, they, they were typical children, and, yeah. they, and they loved to be entertained, right. and they loved me to hold their attention. Right. And, and, and um, not being a trained teacher, I, 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 I was slightly out of my depth with that, and, right. and, and I, I, I felt it, you know, I wasn't very relaxed in that situation, because, yeah. because it's much better to sort of have a grounding in teaching to be able to know how to run a class. Mm -hmm. um, so... Luckily, the winter break came along, yeah. and there was a natural end to that. Okay. And then at that time, I was meeting young Tibetan people mm. who'd made the journey over the Himalayas from, mm. from Tibet. Wow. They'd left their nomad lives. They'd so left... when was this? In the 90s? Right? No, no, this, this wasn't in the 90s. Okay. 2011. I see, I see. Going okay. into 2012. Got it, got it. And so at that time, it was much easier to cross... Um, uh, Nepal and, Kat and Kathmandu. Kathmandu. Since then, it's become harder because because the, Chi the Chinese um, have been sponsoring Nepal and helping right. them with their economy. Right. And because they're involved in in Nepal now, mm -hmm. they're very fussy about the Tibetan refugees crossing Kathmandu. So they've made mm -hmm. it much more difficult. Wow. And it's no longer safe. So right. now, if Tibetan uh, people want to journey to India. Mm -hmm. If they cross Nepal, they they might be arrested. They might just get get sent back home, and wow. and they might go to jail. Even. Were, were you in those um, in those groups when you were going? Uh, those Tibetan groups that were in threat from Chinese what? military power or. Well, I met people who'd been in danger. Oh, I see. I these see. were these were young people. They'd often done it at the age of sixteen. Oh, Some wow. of them did it at the age of 14. Their, their families, they sent them across the mountains. Mm -hmm. um, and it could be a 23 or even a 30-day journey. And, mm -hmm. and they would join a group of people mm -hmm. 
um, crossing the Himalayan mountains, right. and that they would often have hardship in that time. I, I met at least one person whose health had been badly affected because during that time she'd been uh, to, uh, she'd been eating snow. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! They, they didn't wow. have water, so she'd been eating snow yeah. on the journey across the Himalayas, and obviously it was full of dust and pebbles and things. I see. And that had given her. Um, uh, stomach problems, oh, right, you know, right. and she was still only about twenty years old, oh, and um, and so it was a hard trek. Yeah, and and yeah. the families had sent them over, mm -hmm. and most people have got phones these days, right, so they could right. sort of report back. Yeah, but um, but talking to parents back in Tibet on the phone is right. is awkward. You so, know, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can't relax when you're doing it because you think you might get your parents into trouble or right. or you might not get through for some reason you know right. yeah. so these poor young young often young women mm -hmm. but they they were on a massive journey mm -hmm. and the most important thing they had two things they wanted to do number one was meet the dalai lama okay yeah yeah which they all did and he welcomed them he had a route he had a, a regular meeting of the people who were coming to Dharamshala where he would give them an audience and welcome them mm -hmm. And then the second second thing that most of them wanted to do was learn English. Learning, and and you were probably ready to do that. Well, I mean that's why I'd come over to right. to do some English teaching. So initially I thought I would do it at a school, but then I found I was meeting these lovely young people who'd made this amazing journey. Correct. And and a very suitable way to spend time with them was just around a restaurant table. Wow. With some textbooks, some English grammar books, and right. and, and reading, yeah. and and whatever came up in those lessons, that would turn into a lesson. Ah, you lovely, know, lovely, yeah. If we read a book, you know, we'd start discussing something, and that became the lesson. Mm. You know, yeah. And so. and they learned a lot because they were very motivated. Gotcha. So they wanted homework. They did their yeah. homework very conscientiously. Right. And um, and then. Uh, they were showing their gratitude. They would shower me in gifts because they were so grateful that I was giving them that time. Right. So it was a really nice experience for me, and they were lovely young people, mostly mm -hmm. young. Yeah. And uh, but male and female. Yeah. And um, and then a lot of them, you know, they were preparing the ground for maybe travelling abroad, mm -hmm. which depended on them getting visa, school, yeah, passports visa. and visas for other countries. Right. So it took time. Mm -hmm. But the English was a major part of that process, gotcha. and and they've some of them have remained in touch, you know, mm -hmm. and and it was, yeah. they've remained good friends. That's so. This is how yes. you were able to. This was your whole journey of discovering um, Dharamshala and the Tibetan refugees and everything. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, this was my journey. So this your journey yes. for me, it was for them. It was an epic journey. Here and then, here, and then here, yeah. onward to America or Europe or wherever they were going. But for mm -hmm. me, it was an epic journey because I was learning so much from them. It was an mm -hmm. exchange. Right. So they were learning English from me, and I was learning about their lives and the lives of nomads in mm -hmm. in Tibet. Yeah. You know, very often they'd had come from very simple uh, circumstances, mm -hmm. and 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 for me, it was a real pleasure to to to, to just get that from them to. To learn about how they lived and how their families lived, yeah, yeah, what their traditions were. And I'm glad for that this happened because this is how we were able to meet each other, and probably how my father was able to meet yeah, with you. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, it was all part of it. All part and of so, it, yeah. and so, because your family <clears throat> comes from Tibetan roots, mm -hmm. they were very much part of that, right? You know, and part of my learning process about the Tibetan culture, right? Right. Uh, so, so it was, it was fun. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. So. Um, so this is um, this is how your life was uh, in the whole midst of traveling and coming to Dharamshala and everything. But before that, when you were in England, how yes. how did it? Um, how was your life going on when you what growing up as a kid? Well, um, funnily enough, one thing I've got in in common with Tibetan people mm -hmm. is that both of my parents were refugees. Okay, wow. And so as a ch because this is going back a very long way, yeah. but they had been refugees at the end of the Second World War. Okay. As young people, you know, mm -hmm. it's a long time ago, but that's that's what they were. So they'd they'd escaped Eastern Europe and ended up in the south of England. Okay. Without good English. Right. You know, the, uh, they they both of my parents and my stepfather never spoke good English. Right. Um, 
because because they you know they'd made their lives in a completely foreign country and, and they came across with no money right so i came from quite a poor poor background so very similar to uh, my parents as well absolutely yeah. so they traveled to a completely strange country and mm -hmm. at that time there were far less photographs, far less movies. Right. They would have had no idea of where they were going to. I see. You know, they'd have had seen less pictures. Right. Um, and so they ended up in, in a completely strange foreign land. Right. And then both they, my father was from a Polish background. My mother was German. And okay. then they met in the UK when they were doing work. And, right. and uh, both my parents actually were not very well educated, so, mm -hmm. so my mother had worked in a in a shop mm -hmm. and you know selling fur, mm -hmm. funny enough in Königsberg. And my father had been in the Polish army. He he was an officer, mm -hmm. and I think he was quite well educated. Mm -hmm. Sadly, he died when I was four years old. Oh, I'm sorry. So 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 I never got to know my father very well because. I think when you're less than four years old, you don't remember very much, do you? Yeah, no. So I don't remember much about him. Yeah. Um, but I, I know that he was quite well educated, at least. Yeah. And um, and he was an officer in the Polish cavalry, as Polish army, and he travelled around the world and ended up in the UK. Oh, I see. And, um, uh, so that's a very big... Yes. Yeah, it's We've a got... very big move and quite similar to my parents as well. Um, yeah, I think I think both our parents probably came with nothing to a new foreign country and they ended up learning how to make money, learning how to learn the local language yeah. and survive, which is the most important thing. Did your parents speak English before they were here? Uh, when they came here, no, we wow. did not speak English. So my mom went straight to a Tibetan school. Yes. And my dad learned English on his own. Yes, and I think he used to work at this place called Nublinka Institute. I remember right? that. Yes, and I know. he learned English because of his colleagues, and that's yes. he he would meet he would meet uh, foreigners that came to the institute, and then I think that's how he had the curiosity to learn further. Yes, yeah, and he self-taught. He was very motivated, I think, mm -hmm. and I I know your dad, and I know that he reads a lot. Right, right, and he was probably reading masses of books and things and, and really sort of soaking up right. the English language and, and uh, he did brilliantly. I mean, yeah. you know, Thank you. Yeah. he was very well read so when I met him yeah. and, and, you know, uh, everyone is speaking good English now. So mm -hmm. and to, to, to turn up in a foreign land without the language, mm -hmm. without much money, without knowing your future, that's a big deal. Absolutely. As a refugee. Right. You know, and to, and to make it work is, is a good achievement. I think people like you and my father, who I respect a lot, it's one trait that I really find um, fascinating is your and his curiosity. I feel you guys are very um, curious about everything, and that's why I mean, you probably travel a lot to make up for your curiosity, right? Yeah, I, well, I think it's very healthy to be curious. Right, right. And, it, and the so opposite... In terms is, of health also, it's very important. In terms of mental health. Mental health. Uh, yeah, I think um, if you stop being curious, mm -hmm. um, then you're in a downward spiral. Right. Because life is continually presenting you with new things. Yeah. But if you stop experiencing that, mm -hmm. and you're and you're just in a world where nothing is new, okay. you're you're actually in a decline, mm -hmm. because that's not how the world really is. Everything is new all the time, right. and and every every day should be new discoveries. Right. And 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 if that process ceases, then then mm -hmm. then then the world becomes very grey. So so how how is that so important for health in terms in terms of health? Like why is that? A healthy trait to be curious. Well, I think it's because it's healthy to have, to have creative and new thoughts. Okay. And what most people have is that they they especially as they grow older, they live in a world of repetition. Okay. Yeah, you know, I totally agree. I understand that. They're yeah. in a world of routine. Right. And and you know, almost day by day, they're going through the same uh, movements. Mm -hmm. uh, the same events are happening mm -hmm. at the same time, and it becomes a sort of daily circle right. where it's the same thing. And, and, and when you're in a world of repetition, mm -hmm. obviously 
the brain starts to treat things as not new anymore. Right. Unless unless you have some kind of practice or discipline mm -hmm. where you where you can work your way out of that. Correct. And and you know a lot of yoga and a lot of um, meditation mm -hmm. and 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 art. Mm -hmm activities and creative activities like writing mm -hmm. um, they're all to stimulate the brain into seeing the world afresh and to not get into this sort of just repeating pattern where, right. where you stop having to think right you know yeah. and and I think that's very important and and travel mm -hmm. is, is like a shortcut really because you're you're put into a situation but where by default everything is new all the time mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I mean, I've stayed here for a long time, so right. I have routines here. Right. But when you're traveling, you're constantly encountering new situations, mm -hmm. and and that is very stimulating. Right. And and I think that's why people find it very satisfying and, and exhilarating. Right. You know. I don't know if I still have this old thought, but I used to think that instead of traveling, why not read books? Yes. Which which maybe has the same effect. Do you think so? Uh, well, I think that's another form of traveling. Form of traveling. Okay, you that's know, beautifully put. You're yeah. going on a journey through literature. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think I think it's just taking you into something new and, and, mm -hmm. and you can do that where you are and right. you can do that through a book. Mm -hmm. And if somebody presents you with um, ideas which are causing you to, to um, to reappraise the world, okay. then you're in a new place. Right, right. You know, you're actually in a different place. As soon as, as soon as, some, uh, uh, you know, a, root, a habitual way of thinking has changed, mm -hmm. your world has changed with that as well, mm -hmm. because you're seeing the world differently. Yeah, and and write and writing and reading has that effect. Correct, correct. I um, even to my own personal life, I feel that I tend to be on this thing called autopilot a lot and yeah. you're constantly doing things repetitively yes and even as a young child when you're being raised and you're born into the education system yes everything is repetitive yeah that's right and yeah. and i'm sure it's very similar to the job market as well yes after you graduate for most yeah. people but some people like that okay because it's safe yeah, yeah. and some people, some people like the security of being in a nice sort of routine pattern yeah, because it because everything is predictable, correct, and correct. and that's a nice cozy feeling, mm -hmm. and um, for some people, you know that that means that's a good life because I don't feel I'm being threatened or stretched or I'm not having to make a a, a big effort because everything is just sort of yeah. familiar. But I'm sure that familiarity becomes a huge burden later in people's lives. I think it um, because it doesn't really question a individual's purpose or anything no no it's, it's not fulfilling it's no. just it just you just feel like you exist because you exist well i right. think the times where you grow mm -hmm. in terms of character are the times where you're struggling right or right. where you're having to figure something out gotcha and i'm not sure but i think i've heard in the past that the time when humankind when the brain size started to it to get bigger and, and, and the brain started to develop in human beings was during the ice ages when nice. people were presented with with climate catastrophes yeah. and, and they, ha they were having to struggle to survive mm. and they were having to use their in intelligence to, to figure out how to survive in a, in a very hostile world nice. and, and I believe that, yeah. that that helped humankind to evolve. Okay. You know, because okay. because you're forced to, it's drawn out of you. You're forced to have new thoughts. You know, how do I how do I fix this problem? How do I how do I protect my family? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then you, you you have to have new ideas to come up with solutions. Yeah. No, I agree. And, yeah. And that's absolutely. that's development. Yeah. I think right now the the time period is all about. We know that all these repetitive things are just not making humans happy. We know that productivity is not making humans happy. Mm. And maybe we might be in this period of everyone trying to reconnect with our caveman days, reconnect with yeah. the modern technology and how it could help us connect back to how we used to live. I think so, yeah. Like, there's a hype on nutrition, right? Uh, That's true, yes. Carnivore more diet. Yes, and going, and going back to more natural food. More natural food, yes. Um, even, even fasting, right? Before it was not known as fasting because yes. we're trying to survive and find food. Yes. It takes time. Well, I understand that they, yeah. they, they, they established that um, or going hungry a bit actually helps you live longer. 
Right. No, it, I read it, about that. It actually too. expands yeah. your lifespan mm -hmm. if you build a bit of hunger into your lifestyle. So right. maybe fast a bit yeah. or never eat until you're really full, but mm. always eat to the point where you're still slightly hungry. Gotcha. And that, for some reason, is healthier. Yeah. And a, and a bit of hunger built into your life actually might extend your lifespan. Right. So, 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 so that is probably not a bad thing to do. But it's it's very difficult to want to do it, isn't it? I know exactly. Because <laughs> we all like eating. We all like eating. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's too hard to stop that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, you used to code, right? I was. Um, I, I started off by going to art college. Art college. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, that was fun and I did interesting things. I met interesting people, but right. it wasn't my profession. Right. So at a particular age, which I think was around my mid 20s, mm -hmm. I, 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 it became very obvious that yeah. I needed to earn money. Okay. So, yeah. so a very practical thing. I need yeah. to get some cash flow. Yeah. And so the way to do that was I, I trained up in IT. Okay. Uh, was this all um, on your own, self-taught? Uh, well, I had a, a, a job which wasn't very good, but mm -hmm. it was. But it, um, I was in an office where they where they were selling farming equipment, okay. and so they had a sort of system there for recording uh, stock. Right. And they got a very basic early sort of computer there where okay. they 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 did stock taking on this computer. So that for me was like. A first step in learning about computers, mm -hmm. and so while I was there, in a, it was not a very good job, and I wasn't earning much money. But mm -hmm. while I was there, then I started to go to evening classes. I see. Like ad, we have adult education classes in right. the UK. I don't know if you have that. No. So 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 people of a who are past their normal student days, they can still go to college, and then they can train themselves up and get qualifications. Oh yeah, I think in, in the States, I heard it's called night school. Yeah, yeah it's called yeah. night school, edu adult education. Adult education, okay, okay. Well, Similar well, thing. Yeah. So I did an IT course, and one, the first one was very broad, very general, mm -hmm. and then it, it obviously was a good idea, and at that time, still quite a new thing around, and so I, I then left my job, and I went on a six-month training course mm. um, on very little money, but but you know I, I I like to think I've got the the insight to know that if I invest my time, it's going to pay off in the future. Right. So I invested my time and actually got myself into a bit of credit card debt by doing right. this six-month course. Right. Knowing that if I got a job, then I'd get the money back, and then I. Either. This would be my future. So I want, job. To, I want to stop you here for a little yes. bit. Um, when you were in the credit card debt, yes. Um, how how were you able to get out of that? Like, how was your mindset to um, have the cash flow again instead of being bombarded with debts? Well, because I've never been in that situation yet, but I do feel that I should be careful of my spending. You should, and especially as a college student, it's not a good idea to be in debt. Yeah, but I knew that this course was a five or six month course. Okay, so I knew that at the end of that, I wouldn't be borrowing on the credit card anymore. So it was for a limited period, mm -hmm. and I and so. Yeah, I had to live very frugally during that time. I see. And and funny enough, I was running a car. I don't know how I managed to do that, <laughs> um, but because I had to get to college. Um, but at the end of that, I went into a job, okay. so I was no longer borrowing money. Mm -hmm. And so I think it probably took me at least a year, possibly a couple of years, to pay that money down again because I. When I then went into my first computing job, it wasn't well paid. I was still like an apprentice. I see. And, and it took probably, I would think, two, three, or four years for me to reach a level where I was actually being well paid. Right. But right. but it was an act of faith. Yeah. And and sometimes you have to do something. It's an act of faith that that it will work out in the end. And that's what that was. So I allowed myself to get into this credit card debt, mm -hmm. knowing that the next step was to get into a job and to earn some money, and then I'd be able to pay it back. Gotcha. And um, and so to the lesson is to be frugal. Well, the lesson is to keep it under control. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, to, <laughs> and to you know follow a planned path. Yeah. So you can plan for debt. Yeah. And it has its place because it made it possible for me to learn computing. Right. 
but, but then I have to follow the plan, I have to stop borrowing, and then I have to get a job and start earning money. Right. And, though, and you know, I'd known that those were the steps I'm going through. So, so it was a controlled situation. It didn't go out of control. Okay. And, um, and then once I was in a proper job with, with computing, then, then step by step that improved and it improved mm -hmm. until I was earning a good salary. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, yeah. it did. It, was, it, was, it, it improved well. Yeah. And when I think about it, mm -hmm. Um, I was working for a company, as I was working for something called Bird's Eye Walls. I don't okay. know if you've heard of them. Bird's I've never heard of them, no. Okay, Bird's so Eye Unilever, they, they're part of Unilever, which is oh, a big company. Big company, yeah. And so they, make, I, they make soap bars, right? Yeah, they, they, they make pharmace pharmaceuticals, but uh, Bird's Eye is part of that, but they make frozen foods. Oh, okay. Peas and, and fish fingers and things like that. Gotcha. Um, so it was very useful being like an apprentice in a very large company because then I could just learn everything that that company environment had to offer you know so I learned all about being in an office right. working on a computer yeah the whole office culture mm. um, I absorbed all of that and I, I became familiar with that so 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 that became my my working situation yeah. and um, uh, and then I took a bold step because mm. um, at that time yeah there was a you know there was a good demand for IT skills okay and and I, I knew that it was possible to earn more money by becoming independent to work as a consultant so so after a relatively short time when i think about it like three years yeah or or four years yeah not no longer than that mm -hmm. i left my safe permanent job with bird's eye nice. and I, I went freelance oh and, and became an independent consultant and that meant i was doing the it job but i was but when you're freelance, you have less job security, but in return for, and they don't pay for pensions and things like that, yeah. but in, in return for that, you're getting a larger amount of money. Yeah. Uh, and so I just went into a better paid situation by taking that risk. Right, right. You know, by stepping into the unknown. Yeah, stepping into the unknown. And my mother wasn't very happy about that, I'm you know. I'm sure not, yeah. She, she likes the security. <laughs> but, but somehow, you know, it was a controlled risk. Right. And, and it paid off because then I found that my, my income kept improving. Wow, you yeah. Know, and, and it wasn't that long, mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, another two or three years, and mm -hmm. then I managed to put down a deposit on a house. I see. And then I, and, and then I st got a mortgage for a house in the centre of London. Okay. So step by step, you know, I was making progress. And, yeah. And owning a house in central London is a very useful thing. I'm sure it is now, especially. Especially sure, now, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit further about uh, your risk analysis and how you were able to convince uh, yourself that this yes. is the right move. Because obviously freelancing now is like a big thing, but I'm sure back then it was um, very uncertain and very against the, the whole system of how you're supposed to be living and yeah. your career should be. And how my mother was yeah you know how she felt about it exactly. now i'll tell you what this takes us back to the uh, the philosophy and the the, the okay. criticism thing so this is the right you're a very philosophical yeah person, i'm philosophical so. so so i um there comes a point where I, I i feel that i'm i'm in a universe that's bigger than me and sometimes you've got to take a step mm -hmm. and just trust that the larger picture the universe or whatever you want to call it right. is it's all going to fall into place mm -hmm. and and all the circumstances will fall into place around what you're doing right and so you're stepping into the unknown yeah and you've got to trust that it's going to work out mm -hmm. and and there's a bigger picture and and so my sort of philosophical mind takes me through that situation you, it, you know yeah. and i'm and I, I i'm not sure if that's buddhist or it's christian you know yeah but it but it's trusting in it, almost in a higher power that, higher that, power. that you're as long as you know you're doing something that's the right thing, mm -hmm. that it's going to work out. Yeah. And, and, and that's the way to grow as well, because you don't grow by just being safe and secure all the time. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I'm, uh, I think a lot of people like me are probably struggling with that. Like, is there really a well, I didn't. to? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So you struggle with it. Yeah. But well, yeah. you feel the fear and then you do it anyway, you know? Right. That's, that's the, that's, I think what I'm looking into, yeah, yes. that's something that's very important. Yes. Yeah. But you've done a certain amount of that. You've gone to a foreign country. Right. That's correct. Into a very strange situation. Yeah. And put yourself in a in a demanding setup. So mm -hmm. you've done a certain amount of that. Yeah. You're not 
playing it safe. Yeah, it's it's very funny. I think at first you hear these sorts of um, let's say you're going to a new um, new country and yeah. you have an opportunity to study at a very good university, and obviously I come from a very small town, so this is like maybe a dream come true. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, but once you live in that environment and you immerse yourself with all the people, you tend to forget the gratitude. You tend to forget, you, you tend to stop being thankful. Yes. Right? And um, I think day before yesterday, I was talking to a person who graduated from Columbia University. Mm -hmm. And obviously for some people, this is like a very big move. I mean, it's, it's like a dream come true again, yes. Yes. because you're going into an Ivy League school and you might, meet a lot of uh, great minds, you might have the best professors in the world. Yes. But once you're in that environment, you, you, you just forget all the all the things that you should be grateful for. Yes. And, and this is a very um, human tendency. I think yes. some psychologists call it uh, the default network, right. default, uh, default neural uh, activity or something. But yes, yeah. And it's very funny. So Do you think that's inevitable? I think that is inevitable, maybe. Maybe yes. we are, um, in a way, pessimistic, but, but, but there's so much more to be optimistic. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, I, I often meet in this environment where people are doing yoga and this and that, mm -hmm. there's a lot of sort of people who are thinking deeply about life. I think that's one reason I like Dharamshala, gotcha. is because often the people who travel are the ones who are asking questions yeah. and who are, who are curious. Yeah. And, and, and people like that, and often young people, which I find very refreshing, are coming here full of curiosity and asking questions, they're, and they're discussing deep things in life. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that there is a set of people mm -hmm. who realise that it's necessary to train yourself to be grateful. Okay. And, and, and they, they, especially if, if a teacher tells you this, you know, to go through an exercise in the morning where you know you think of several things that you should be grateful for mm -hmm. and, and and make it a daily ritual you know, right. thank you for this just keep remind yourself yeah. how lucky you are and how privileged you are yeah. and 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 people can make it a conscious sort of exercise to go through to remind themselves mm -hmm. and and i think that's very helpful and there are people who do that right you right. know and yeah. so you can sort of snap out of it but you've got to have some awareness of it yeah. to want to do that yeah yeah, which is uh, which is very, um, which is definitely neglected in the education system, mm. right? It's all about yes. uh, getting the best grades. It's all about uh, do better than your peers. Yeah, it's, it's all about it's materialistic. It's it? very materialistic. Yeah. Um, competition in itself is obviously good. Yeah, that's how you're able to grow as a as a human. Yeah, I believe. I think if there's no competition, then yeah, it's people would bit slack off. It's a bit flat, then, isn't it? Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but, but I also feel that uh, these sorts of things are actually working out, uh, like how to be, how to have better mental health, yeah, how to yeah. involve gratitude, like you said. And mm -hmm. there's even researchers of journaling can also help. Uh, I, I'm a strong believer in journaling. Right. And, right. Um, you read a lot of books. I, I'm yeah. quite sure that you probably journal a lot as well. Well, what I find is because I like writing things down. Yeah. You know, I've done a certain amount of writing just for myself in the right. past. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, but I find the process of writing mm -hmm. fo focuses the mind, and especially if I'm struggling with a question or a problem, mm -hmm. if I journal, if I do some journaling, if I write a diary, and I just, <laughs> if I'm trying to figure something out, if I write it down, mm -hmm. and just very thoroughly go through the whole of it, almost in the form of an essay. Gotcha. That process forces my mind to become clearer and to and to formulate mm -hmm. what I really think what I'm really thinking I see. where I really am in my mind I see uh, and and the process yeah. sometimes helps me to figure out the solution to the problem or to take me forward yeah and it certainly clarifies my mind so I'm, I'm a strong believer in journaling yeah even if nobody ever reads it even if I you see. never read it again but right. the process of doing it it's not about someone who reads it's it's, it's for it's for your mind to yeah. Uh, to think clearly it's, it's for you it's, it's for a, you yeah journaling for me is a tool it's a tool you know yeah. and uh you know probably you you don't want anyone to see it right exactly but yeah. you've done it and that has 
has helped. I see, I see. You know, so so I, I'm yeah. a strong believer in that. When I was a young kid growing up, I used to despise journaling. Oh, really? I thought it was a very uh, weird activity. And hmm. maybe it was just because I was brainwashed with my friends and everything. I don't know, but I just, I didn't really see the importance of it. No. But, but as I grew up and I go into a, a foreign country and... And I struggle with my own deprecating thoughts sometimes, which is very humane, I believe. Well, yeah. yeah it's very annoying, but this does happen. It's human nature it's very human often nature. Exactly. to be self-deprecating. Exactly. And not in a comedic way, but like no, no, in, no. in a real serious pro problematic way. No, people, yeah. some people have a real problem with it. And, yeah. um, you know, it's, some people need help with that. Exactly. You know, and you, as you grow older, some, some people... <laughs> Some people learn yeah. to deal with it, and they learn to not be badly affected by it. But it, but everything's a learning process, and and dealing with self criticism and self deprecating thoughts mm -hmm. is something that is part of your development. Right. And for some people, it comes naturally, yeah. and I think early parenting probably helps with that because if your parents um, mm -hmm. uh, give you a lot of confidence in the way they bring you up, then right. that's going to help you a lot. Gotcha. Whereas if if your parents Without realizing they mean well, but if 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 they bring you up in a way where where they're not giving you confidence, where where you're afraid to do things, and they, and they they don't you know they're not they don't realize that they can help you with that. Right. Then you can grow up feeling fearful, yeah, and then you have to deal with it later in life. So so when you're dealing with it later in life, yes, uh, maybe someone like me, my age, uh, who lived like, who lived like sorry. So, that's right so maybe someone like me um who who maybe had a same scenario as your parents mm -hmm. um, who's growing up now in this modern world uh, yes and maybe they don't have both their parents with them mm -hmm. uh, which is very uh, sad but i'm sure this is uh, quite common and it's um so how would this individual grow up and how would he or she try to make up for it? How would he gain that confidence? What are some sources? Is it books? Is it Well, I'll, te I'll tell you what, it's not unusual mm -hmm. to meet people who have had different ch difficult childhoods. Right, yes. And, and I meet a lot, yes. yes. I meet a lot. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and no, I, it's not unusual even for me to meet, to meet people who've, who've had childhood trauma, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. for various reasons. It happens for various reasons. One of them, they might be to do with the death of a parent, okay. but they've had childhood trauma and this has badly affected their confidence, Yeah, I'm you know. Sure. But one thing that it can do mm -hmm. is, as you grow up, mm -hmm. you're dealing with, with the effect of a, a, a traumatic event in your childhood, mm -hmm. and that spurs you on to try and figure out how to deal with it, and 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 how to how to how to um, cope with things, and how to move forward, and how to be confident. You know, and and pe you know when people are struggling with something. There's a good side to that, which is it's forcing them to figure out how to how to improve and how to deal with it, and they become stronger people. Very often, I, see. I think so. Yeah, I think that happened with me as well. You know, so, I, I know that I struggled with things like that, mm -hmm. but it took me to a place yeah. where I was having to figure things out, and and in that process, I was somehow growing as well. I see. I see. You know. Yeah. Where if somebody has an easy time and they receive everything too easily and mm -hmm. they never have any hardship, nothing ever goes wrong. Right. Uh, they're not developing, I don't think. Okay, okay, yeah. I think I absolutely agree with you. Um, mm. Although I didn't have a similar circumstance, mm. uh, my dad did send me far away from oh, yes, my yes. Uh, parents, and I was very young. I'm sure a lot of my classmates had yes. the same experience at that time. How old was that? Six years old? Or? Uh, I was nine years old. Nine years yeah. old, right. Okay. So when we left, uh, when I left, then, yeah, I ha had a long distance with my father. And in a way, I was sort of concerned uh, that maybe I didn't have the proper father figure. Maybe I didn't spend enough time with my mother. And this is not a good way of looking at it. Maybe yes. I could label it as a trauma. Yes, uh, which, is, which, is, which I think is overused these days. Yeah, yeah. I mean there is trauma, right. but it's a powerful thing. So, right. so, but struggling or trying to cope with the problem—that's yeah. not. not a, there are different levels of it, aren't there? Exactly. So going through self-doubt. Yeah. That's not trauma, 
but you're still struggling with self-doubt yes and 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 questioning and, and 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 it's undermining you yeah so so that is something that a lot of people have to deal with absolutely and you had to deal with that in that situation yeah. but now i am more grateful that this did happen because yeah. like you said it was more of a a mindset shift it was more of what does it feel like if my father was metaphorically dead right and yeah, yeah. how how am i able to be the man of my family but yeah yeah it matures you in a way and you're that having was... you're having to learn how to deal with the situation yes and that's a useful process right even though it might actually not be much fun at the time exactly exactly you know yeah, yeah. and and um and that's the thing i think there's a lot of people who are in this world who are very successful or mm -hmm. who seem to be doing really well mm -hmm. and and often the people who are the most carefree mm -hmm. are the ones who've had to deal with very difficult things in the past yeah and they've they've learned to deal with it and that's why they've brought themselves to a de better place I but they, but in the past they've had to work through things yeah you know yeah. and and that's been part of their journey yeah yeah i think i absolutely agree um when I went to Tibet when I was 15, uh, I would see nomads and obviously their life is very simple. You wake mm -hmm. up early morning and then the, a male would be probably going out uh, riding a horse and um, taking care of the livestock. And then a, a woman would be probably milking or taking care of her kids. Uh, yes. Uh, but a very simple lifestyle, but then you would see that sheer joy. Yes. And and this would make you happy also. Yeah, too. that's true. This yeah. Nice. Even though I come from the same bloodline, I didn't grow up like that. So no, no. Even going into uh, my relative's home and the way they lived, it, it did bring the sense of uh, gratitude. Yes. And Well, it was very educational. I'm it sure. was very educational, exactly. Yes. That's, what I was, that was the right word, yeah. And, and, you know, if I'm putting myself in your shoes now, mm -hmm. so you're, you're studying in Colorado. Yeah. Now... You know, if I was in your situation, I would yeah. just have these flashbacks. You know, where where could I have been right now? Right. right. I could have been in a nomad yeah. yurt, yeah, <laughs> traveling across the Tibetan plateau, yeah, with a herd of animals. Yes. That could have been. You know, I was very close to having that as my destiny. Yeah. yeah. But things happened. Mm -hmm. But that could have been my destiny, and that's uh, you know that. The contrast between that and where you are now, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's very relevant to you, isn't it? Yeah, and not only to me, I think that is the the proper and the right way of thinking for anyone, right? Yes. Where did I come from and where am I right now? And that yes. analysis really does determine yes. how you're able to get that enough fuel. What an amazing journey has brought you to where you are now. Right. And that applies to me because both my mm -hmm. parents yeah. they came from East Europe. Mm -hmm. They were caught up at the tail... They were caught up in a world war situation. Right. We're talking about a long time ago now, yeah. but that's that, that was it. Mm -hmm. uh, world events yeah. caused them to go through terrible hardship. Nothing beyond... The, this is everything that was not within their control. No, yeah. world events were totally beyond their control. Exactly. Uh, the family was completely destroyed mm -hmm. uh, in various ways yeah. or separated. Yeah. Uh, they ended up in different places. And, and as a refugee, somehow my mother mm -hmm. ended up in a really good place, which was called Godalming. Godalming, yeah. I love to say that word. God, Godalming Godalming. In, in, in near Guildford in, yeah. in south of London. I see. And my father, through his own amazing set of circumstances, ended up in Godalming too. I see, yeah. And so these two people what a met. Yeah. And then they married, and, and here I am. Yeah. And what amazing circumstances had to happen in order for me to grow up there in yeah. what was probably a really good place to grow up. I see, I see. You know, they chose what, what, well. What was so amazing about that? Well, I think, you know, just just place. just the, 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 the quality of life in the UK I see. at that time at that was time. good. The education was good, the healthcare was good. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm um, sure you're quite close to nature as well, because I didn't hear that place. So. Well, yeah, there's, there was a lot of countryside around. Oh, countryside, home, yeah. Up. Yes, you're right, you're right. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was just the whole quality of it was, you know, compared to where I might have been in, in Eastern Europe somewhere, um, you know, where all this fighting is going on. Yeah. Um, uh, Ukraine's a nice country, but obviously they've got conflict. Yeah. And um, so, so where I was, it was a place of peace, mm -hmm. a place of 
good education, which was which was provided very easily. Yeah. And um, I had lots of friends. I love the English language. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. I love. Sp- uh, people tell me I speak like the BBC. I see. And, <laughs> and that's because of where I grew up. That's actually true. I do hear that and, a lot. And, <laughs> and, um, and, and I love it because I, yeah. I'm very fond of that. Yes, absolutely. And it's very good for traveling when you speak like the BBC. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. Because everyone has watched the BBC and then they would well, think that a reporter is Well, they think you're a good person to learn from. You yeah. Know, that's nice. So yeah. it's a, so it's a good conversation piece, you know. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so amazing circumstances okay. came together in order for me to be born where I was. Mm-hmm. You know, it's unimaginable. It's unimaginable, yeah. yeah. Perfect for you, yeah. 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 That's wonderful. Um, so what are a lot of, uh, what are some of interesting uh, things that you have found recently that you might pursue further into your life while you're constantly traveling and what are those hooks that you're like, oh, I should probably deep further into it? Yeah, it's, it's funny, isn't it? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm trying to think of things that have appeared recently. Mm-hmm. What I do find is that, you know, each, it's every, every year or every few months, I'm in a new situation that's unfolding and I'm meeting new people. Okay. And, and that leads to new things. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and because these people come from all over, that's why I like... Donald Shaw and McLeod Ganges, because people are coming from all over the world, yeah. and they're bringing all kinds of different influences in their lives, and, and I'm sort of connecting with people in different ways. True. And it's a it's it's a continual process uh-huh. uh, because there's a, there's a sort of turnover of people here, right? Of, of meeting new things and then hearing about new things and getting involved in new things. Yeah, yeah. And so even last winter. Mm-hmm. I was house sitting a, a cottage in the jungle up on the mountain, nice. surrounded, you know, and apparently they found bear footprints walking oh. around the cottage, you know, the, the, there was wildlife up there and leopards up there. And yeah. I was in this sort of winter situation oh. in the middle of this jungle kind of thing. And, and, and you know, I'd never anticipated that, right. that I would ever do that. And yeah. There I was in this remote place, house sitting a little cottage for some people. Nice. And that was a new experience for me. Yeah. And, um, and that's not a major thing, right? But but there's a succession of things which are mm. which are new that come along. Like when I went to Spiti, yeah, not so long ago, okay. I was just sitting in a restaurant and and in a very leisurely way. So yeah. I had time, and I was observing that there was broken glass everywhere. I see. And and they had a terrible problem with young young people coming from the mountains, usually young very men. Far. Yeah. drinking beer and then oh. smashing the bottles oh, I see. and and it was one of those things where the entire community in Kaza yeah. in Spiti yeah. seemed to be sort of immune to this and they were just letting the glass build up without doing anything about it I see. And, and and so there, there was a, there was something in the air where everybody knew that mm, this wasn't quite right but yeah. nobody was actually doing anything about it I see. so I, I bought some rubber gloves and some tongs okay. and a cardboard box and, and I used my luggage carrier as a trolley Oh, and wow. I went around the town picking up broken glass and bottles. Wow. And it, it attracted a lot of attention. Right. And, um, and suddenly it became a sensation. And, uh-huh. um, and then there, there was a, just an effect. You know, immediately people started joining in. Wow. And, and, the, and there was a so man... It was a movement. Yeah, it became a movement. Yeah. And, and I was even invited to go to a local government meeting. Wow. And, and, the, shop, and the shopkeepers started to give me free meals and... Mm-hmm. and and they, they would actually release the, the, the young people in their kitchens to go out for an hour or so to help pick up glass. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it caught on. Yeah. And, and I mean, that was completely spontaneous. Who could have ever... And then I met the King of Spitty. <laughs> Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> no, who, who said, why are you doing this? Who yeah. are you? And, um, and it was just a lovely thing, you know. Yeah. And all of that was just spontaneous. And, wow. and, and uh, to me, this is an ideal, is, is mm-hmm. to, to go through life without a plan yeah. and just to see what happens. Yeah. And, very, and, and if you're just open to it, things, things do happen in front of you and you go with them and then this becomes a new life experience. Okay. And, and that's how I view that. Yeah. And it was lovely. And I met some lovely people and made some lovely friends through that process. I see, I see. And, and, and yeah. that's one of the best parts of right. traveling as I am now. I'm just constantly meeting nice people. And these sort of um, serendipitous experiences mm-hmm. can maybe even become your own purpose. 
Well, absolutely. Because, because something could be very meaningful to the local community that you have impacted. Yes. And then this becomes another whole fuel for you to live absolutely, yeah. with that sort of um, beneficial act to people around you. Right? Yeah, it becomes part of, part of yeah. my life and my existence at that time. And it goes in, it becomes part of me, absolutely. Right. You know, I've, in that process, so, I've probably changed a bit because, yeah. because I've gone through something where I've been helping a community and, mm -hmm. and that's enriched me. Gotcha. In, you know, so you do this work where you get involved in helping other people and doing something for the environment, which is yeah. very much what that was. Yeah. And, and the process of doing this is satisfying because it's enriching you as well and, yeah. and, and broadening you in various ways. Yeah. You yeah. know, so it's a good process and travel lets you do that. But and it's good. I like having very few plans and just going along with whatever's happening. Right. You right. know, and, and I'm sure this was uh, something that probably freaked you out before when you're a lot younger. Well, it's you not, it's not normal. Plans. It's not normal. Yeah. And it's not what my, most people, especially my mother, encouraged. Right. And, uh, <laughs> um, you know, so, so there is an element of being philosophical, maybe spiritual, trusting in a larger entity or something like that behind it. I see. You know, trusting. Yeah, you trusting. Know, yeah. Just go with what happens and you trust it. Yeah. And, and, um, and so, you know, maybe that's, that's why I, I, like, I like that. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. Um, yeah, that's lovely. And and life gives you so much in return. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're if you're open to what's going on around you, you become you you amazing things come your way. Mm -hmm. So sometimes maybe it's just only the act of changing your environment that could help you uh, reach for uh, interests. In your life, maybe you yeah, want to bring yeah. more interest. Maybe it's just about changing your environment. Yeah, it's stimulating. Or it's stimulating. Yeah, it's stimulation with with an impact to some other uh, other human's life could maybe bring another yeah. uh, whole set of purpose, right? Yeah, I mean, but it's obviously a lot more vague than that. But well, it's very easy. Yeah, for somebody in a privileged position, right, to do something which will totally change someone's life. Right. For instance, a shoe man at the side of the road mm -hmm. is actually supporting his family, <clears throat> yeah. and you know he's doing this through through repairing shoes, yeah. and he might get fifty rupees or something for doing the shoe repair. Yeah. He's got to support the family with this, and and you go you might go through a, a period where the weather's bad, you have the monsoon, and then and then there's not many people here, yeah. and he's getting no custom, so. He's getting no money to feed his family. Yeah, you know, so so a, an act of generosity towards somebody who is clearly so near to a subsistence level, right? Where you know, every 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 day makes a difference to whether they survive or not. Mm -hmm. If you just help someone like that out by giving them business, mm -hmm. or you know, I've given people blankets and clothes and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, um, to some degree, you know, things, those acts where you're helping people and mm -hmm. getting involved in them is changing their lives. And, 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 and you know, it's having an effect. Oh, I see. I you know, see. and it's, um, you know, for a traveler like me, it's no, not a big deal. Yeah. But for someone who's living just on the edge of, um, you know, not being able to feed their family, that, that is a big deal. Got it, got it. Know? Yeah. So you can really make a difference. Mm -hmm. And then I love animals too. Mm -hmm. And and I, I I'm very fond of seeing the street dogs here and things like that. Yeah. So, with, even with the animals, yeah. they're struggling to survive. If you help them to survive, if you help them to eat, it's 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 an amazing thing. I I love that experience of getting involved and in, yeah and 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 um, interacting at all levels. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's yeah. I think I was thinking in terms of um, it does make someone happier if they're buying something for someone else other than yourself right yeah absolutely. that that feeling of um, happiness is so much more yes yeah and i felt it personally when i um when i would buy some stuff for my parents or yes. you know, buy for my sister and that that happiness is so much greater than some buying something for myself yes right yes well i think if you only buy things for yourself right you know, um, there's a lot of miserable people in this world who I do that. You yeah. know, they own fantastic cars and mm -hmm. have flat screen TVs yeah. and, and the latest iPhone, but but it's all just 
fuel cells, and those people are not the happiest people. Mm -hmm. No, I agree, yeah. There was this term, I don't know which psychologist called it, but it was called the Detroit effect. The what? Detroit effect. The Detroit effect. Detroit? No, uh, Detroit. Detroit effect. I can't pronounce it. Properly. I actually don't recognize the word, so I'm not sure. But it just means that uh, there will be a spiral of ball, uh, buying other um, products when you first buy the first one. Let's yes. say like if you buy an iPhone. Oh, yes. It's structured in a way that it needs other additional accessories. Yes, it's, me it's, it's only for a limited time and then you need to buy exactly. another one. Yeah. When you buy an iPhone, you think an iPhone will be satisfactory, but then yeah. you forget about the screen protector, you yeah. forget about the adapter yeah. that comes yeah. without it. There's a whole chain of things you need. Yes. Chain of things that you have to buy. And then you have to upgrade anyway. Right, yes. right. And this is probably a lot of how things work. Yes. Right. And uh, even since the 1950s, mm -hmm. um, you know, a washing machine in the 1950s mm -hmm. might last for several decades. Right. Whereas if you buy a washing machine now, yeah. it's it's got built-in obsolescence. They actually deliberately make it so that it won't work more than about five years. I see. And then it'll start breaking down, and you'll yeah. need to replace it. Yeah. And this is built built in. Yeah, because they want you to keep buying and buying and buying. So there's there's yeah. a sort of chain all the time you're right. wanting, isn't there? Yeah, I'm yeah. sure there is, and I feel that it's probably happening with a lot of um, electronics when you get those yearly updates. Yeah, I yeah. feel like it's actually making it worse for my. Yeah, no, I, I, had, yeah. I had a fantastic Apple computer, right? but it just stopped working. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it took about a decade, yeah. but it did just stop working. Yeah. You know, uh, nothing. So, I was happily using it, but but it would no longer function. Right. So this is probably. So you think this is like purposefully done? Well, it's it is built in. Sure, I, th yeah. I think I think the manufacturers plan for this mm -hmm. because they want you to keep buying and spending mm -hmm. money. Yeah. So yes, I think it is purpose. And yeah. it is. It's called built-in obsolescence. This built is built-in obsolescence. Thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So you'll be heading off to Spiti tomorrow, right? That's right. To Manali first. To Manali first. Um, and then here the humidity is very high. Right, that's why you're leaving. And and I I don't you know I, it's a big adventure being here in the monsoon. But I I don't like everything just being damp all the time. Yeah, of course. And and so, when you reach Manali, which is a day's drive away, already the air is drier. Mm -hmm. It might still be raining, but the air is drier. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as you go up and mm -hmm. gain altitude, as you head up into the mountains. Yeah. Uh, at some point, I, I I was able once to look over my shoulder, mm -hmm. and I could see the whole monsoon cloud system spread below me, and yeah. I, I and I had driven above it in, yeah. a, in a bus, oh. and it was over my shoulder, and and beyond that point, the air was dry, nice. and it was a completely different climate. Beautiful. So you can physically see it; you can physically see yourself coming out of the monsoon. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah it's quite yeah. spectacular. Yeah. Um, I think the last topic that I want to ask you, because oh, yeah. um, I've already taken a lot of your time, um, is w w what are some of the detrimental things you think uh, a lot of the younger generation is facing right now, like in terms of obviously the um, technologies, in terms of um, the way of living, and do you think that if you were um, if you were younger right now, like you would mm. probably stay away from it? What do you think? Well, I because right now we live. I feel we live in this world of um, constant stimulation. Yeah, chasing after what you want to do. Yes, there's no, um, there's no, there's nothing hard anymore. Everything is easy. I feel. No, I mean that could change at any time. Right, but that yeah. could change at any because time. We're on a planet which isn't as stable as we think. It exactly, is. and like you said, yes. everything is constantly changing. So yes, you might feel that this um, this way of lifestyle of just constantly feeling. Um, always stimulated and, yeah. and, and dopamized. I don't know if that's the word. But. I, I think there are people who come to their senses. Yeah. They're usually in the minority. Yeah. But there, there are people who realize what's going on. Yeah. And I think if somebody realizes what's going on, yeah. then at that point where they become conscious of it, they can deal with it mm -hmm. and they can start to take steps out of it. Gotcha. So you can decide not to be looking at your phone all the time. Yeah. You know, it's a, it is a, it can be a choice. Of course, you can, you can realize, you know, your phone's in your hand. You're looking at it every ten seconds, and and you're never, you're distracted all the time. Yeah, 
and, and more of your attention is going into your phone than, than into looking at the world where you, you know your surroundings. Right. So you can make a conscious, you can realize that, mm -hmm. and then as soon as you realize that and think, I'm not very happy with what this is doing to me, yeah. then you can make a change. And, and, and I think this is a process that people go through. They suddenly realize that this is, this is, this is not very good for the quality of my life. It's making me anxious. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I'm distracted all the time, mm -hmm. that all my children, you know, people's children are so distracted that they can't study, and then you have all kinds of problems arising from that. Yeah. Um, so once you realize that this is not right, mm -hmm. then, you, then you make an effort to deal with it. So you, people have to have that realization first. Right, okay. You know, or else the parents have to give guidance on it. Yeah, which is, which is very hard, I also feel, because I think a lot of parents have um, their jobs that they yes. have to go to, and I'm sure a lot of children are not being taken care of their parents as much as no. it's happening in, in your generation. No. One thing actually that annoys me a bit is when I'm in a cafe or a restaurant. Yeah. And I know for a fact that if, if a mother and father with two young kids yeah. sit next to me, okay. I'm just about to be bothered by a terrible noise of smartphone games yeah. or iPad <laughs> weird little electronic noises because yeah. these kids they've been given these devices as pacifiers right to keep them distracted yeah literally to keep them distracted, distracted yes. so that the parents can sit at the table and and they can have a minute to themselves i see, I see you know yeah. and so uh, so a, a, a small child with a smartphone or an ipad yeah in a restaurant it's a recipe for this awful sound right i know <laughs> you know because I, I spend a lot of time reading books right and so that distracts me yeah i'm sure <laughs> I'm sure it's very distracting. You know, and so, but these children, so what's it doing to them? You yeah, know, so that's, that's something they, that I'm really they can't just sit there. concerned about. Yeah. They can't just sit there and appreciate where they are. They, 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 they're habituated to, to be given a distraction so that they've got something to preoccupy them rather than just being in the room. Yeah, yeah. And, and in the end, that's bad training, I think. Gotcha. You know, and what yeah. does that do in the long term? Right. We, we, we don't know, but I'm sure something disastrous will happen. I mean, we do know a little bit right now. Yes. There is a problem of um, low attention span. People yeah, are not able yeah. to focus as long as they used to. Well, there's a very interesting fact to do with reading and books, uh -huh. which is a hundred years ago, or yeah. in, in the time of Charles Dickens, okay. the average number of words in a sentence yeah. was a lot. I see. So, um, a I lot of old books have longer yeah, sentences, I mean, right? You can get the statistics. There is a, they can actually put a number to this. How many words mm -hmm. the average sentence had. Yeah. And then decade by decade, especially speeding up towards now, a sentence in a paragraph, each sentence has got fewer words in it. Oh, wow. Because uh, so, so someone reading an, an old book from... Charles Dickens or Thomas Hardy or from that era mm -hmm. where they used to write in this slow style, yeah. they will have trouble maintaining their attention for the whole of the paragraph. Yeah. And, and, and they'll reach the end of the sentence and they'll think, what, what, what was the beginning of this sentence that I'm still on? Yeah. You know, because their brain hasn't held it together. They haven't learned to stay focused. They're wow. already off in all kinds of directions. Yes. Whereas in the past, people were able to cope with with being focused on something for a longer period of time. Yeah. And so the modern technology is is training our brains to be constantly distracted, to only focus on something for a short time and then move on to something else. Right. You know, and, and we're encouraged because there's reasons why people for some people that's a profit is profitable for you to be like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, but but it's an interesting thing that, that you can actually get statistics about the number of words in the sentence and how it's get, become less and less and less decade by decade. I see, I see. That's already happened right now in terms of videos. Yeah, I'm sure. Like when know. YouTube first came out, I'm sure a lot of videos were long form contents. I'm sure, you're right. But yeah. now there's a huge demand for short clips. Yeah, sound bites. Sound bites, yes. exactly. And this is also obviously causing different problems such as yes. this guy is saying this and this guy's saying that and they're not getting the whole picture and there's a huge misinterpretation yeah absolutely oh, oh there's so much misinterpretation, misinterpretation of yeah. short clips because yeah because you can read things in different ways and yeah and the way something is read isn't necessarily the way it was intended exactly um but i i think it's a bit, a bit sad because i I think there's a tremendous pleasure in reading something like an old novel, mm -hmm. like Thomas Hardy. I, I, you know, there's a couple of his books which I really loved. I see. And and I'd like to think that young people might be 
discovering those, rediscovering those Alice. old novels and learning how to read them yeah. in a style that modern books don't so, so often present you with. Maybe, maybe modern, there are some modern books which are better, mm -hmm. but, but the, the, the normal experience with smartphones and technology yeah. doesn't work at that pace. I see, yeah. But they're so rich, you know, yeah. and I think, I think you, you have a much richer experience if you can remain focused on something for a longer period of time. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you for taking time to do this video. I've enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you and I uh, hope the best for your trip and everything. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you guys for watching. And I'll see you again. Yeah, see you. Okay, bye. bye, -bye. <laughs> Wonderful.